Good evening. Now that I have the right microphone. <laughs> Good evening. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the third annual Elena Diane Curris Lecture on Global Issues. Uh, my name is Richard Marcus, and I'm the director of the Global Studies Institute here at Cal State Long Beach. You know, we, we live in really interesting times. Uh, how we view global relationships and uh, interchanges is being challenged for economic marginalization. It is created for resurgent nationalism, for rising senses of prejudice inherent therein. Yet at the same time, our globality, our international state of being, our human, economic, and political interconnectedness has never been greater. If the 20th century was about globalization, the 21st century appears to be figuring out what it means to be globalized and how to make the relationships work for us in every corner of the globe. Our modes of communication, the art we create, the technologies we imagine into being, the rights we protect, the education we lead, the communities we build, the bonds we forge, in every part of the globe. Such reimagining of our world is at the heart of the talk tonight uh, by Ambassador Munter, uh, and indeed this lecture series itself. So I want to take this opportunity to thank a few people who made this evening possible. Uh, first, let me start by thanking the Curris family, uh, Dino, Joe, Bob, Bobby, uh, Alice. Um, it's been such a joy to get to know you, uh, to get to know you for what you do for this university, uh, for the memory of Elena, uh, but also for who each of you are individually and collectively. Uh, it's really been a joy for me, and you'll hear from Bob in just a few minutes. Uh, I want to thank the Solanke family, uh, Patma Solanke here today uh, with us. Uh, Elaine Hagland, I saw somewhere uh, wandering around, CSULB's global visionary. Uh, our Global Studies Institute fellows, uh, Beta Castillo, Noel Chin, and Ave Maria Kim. Uh, uh, two of whom at least are with us tonight. Uh, members of the Global Studies Institute Advisory Board. Um, Terry Wright in the Political Science Department, David Schaefer in the History Department, and particularly Tim Kern, uh, Director of the Andwanden Center for Needed Studies, all of whom were pivotal in making tonight possible. I want to make sure to also thank uh, our team in University Development, uh, Becky Zafrino, Howie uh, Fitzgerald, uh, and others. And mostly, I also want to make sure to thank uh, our University President, uh, Jane Connolly, where would we be without her? Uh, her tireless support of our campus and students is really an example for presidents of universities everywhere. It, this extends in myriad directions, uh, but not the least of which includes support for students who often find themselves at the margins in their daily lives, the persistent focus on who we are as a transformative institution, and to the point of this evening, the placement of CSULB as an institution dedicated to ensuring that our students are prepared for their global futures, regardless of their field of study, and whether it be in global California or anywhere around the world. So with that, let's please welcome President Jane Connolly. Isn't it great to be president? People say such nice things about you. I really appreciate that. So thank you very much, Richard. Um, so I am so delighted to be with you all this evening and welcome you to the annual Elena Diane Curris Lecture on Global Issues. And to hear from Ambassador Munter, who I had the joy to have uh, lunch with today and have described it as a master class in international relations. Uh, and I'm looking forward to his vision of a new direction for 21st century diplomacy, as I know all of you are. Uh, let me echo Richard's um, deep appreciation to the Curris family. We're so happy to have Joe and Dino, 
Bobby and Bob and Alice Hearn here. You've come thousands of miles and your spirit and your support makes this, makes this possible. Elena, as you know, was a much admired member of our University Relations and Development Division. Her many friends and colleagues, some of whom are here tonight on campus um, and in the community, were inspired by Elena in many ways, but particularly in her zest for adventure. She was really an adventurous young woman, and by her compassion and kindness, and by, I think, what I noticed, her boundless curiosity about the world. Now, through the creation of this endowed lecture series, we many more members of our Beach family will be exposed to the kinds of issues and ideas that so interested Elena. The need for global understanding is perhaps greater now than ever before. Maybe not, the ambassador will tell us. It feels that way. Um, to make sense of issues such as human rights, a subject that I know is of special interest to the Kars family, and the role of non-state actors in diplomacy, and Ambassador Munter's topic for the evening, we need to hear from and engage with leaders across the field. And this uh, lecture series allows us to do that. The Elena Diane Kars Lecture on Global Issues is advancing our efforts as a university to foster enthusiasm uh, to, uh, enthusiasm for and understanding of the sensitivity of global issues at the beach. I know one member of our uh, uh, audience, I don't see her because of the lights, but uh, Jessica is here, who's the director of our Peace Corps effort. And I'm so proud that at the beach, we have one of the largest contingents of students who go to the Peace, Peace Corps throughout the United States. And I think that's no accident. And I think we can really build on that as preparing our students to be global citizens. Uh, it's profoundly, it's been a profoundly important gift from the Curris family uh, because they are a family of great passion and compassion. So Joe, Dino, Bob, Bobby, and Alice, we're glad to be working with you to honor Elena's memory by empowering people to act thoughtfully and creatively uh, on issues of global significance. So thank you, really, for entrusting us with this responsibility. We're really proud to be part of it, and go Beach. Right there and dark here, so I have to be careful. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the third annual Elena Diane Curris Memorial Lecture. Wow, they got really loud. <clears throat> I am Bob Curris, as previously stated. I'm Elena's brother. And on behalf of the Curris family, I want to thank you for your attendance tonight. I also want to thank <clears throat> President Conley and Dr. Richard Marcus for your continued support of this program. It has truly been outstanding, and as a family, we applaud you both. I want to thank the program board for continuing to, to find compelling speakers for this event. <clears throat> We truly appreciate you adding Ambassador Munter as one of the voices. However, before we start, I must, uh, I think it's important to frame why we are here. My sister Elena <clears throat> was here at CSULB for several years um, and in different jobs, finishing as the Director of Community Projects and Marketing until her passing in December of 2015. After she passed, we looked for ways to honor her memory, and in so doing, we looked at her accomplishments in life. One of the things that she was most proud of was her involvement and in planning for the President's Forum on International Human Rights under then President Alexander. She was quick to tell you it was one of the most stressful things she had ever done, but was very proud of the outcome. Elena was a perfectionist for such things and would have been horrified at the slightest mistake. But by all accounts from others who attended, it went off without a hitch. So under dad's leadership, and with that memory in mind, we pursued this scholastic endeavor to bring global topics back to CSULB and the community. It is our sincerest hope that you leave here tonight more informed, enlightened, and fulfilled than when you came in. It is also our sincerest hope that you remember my sister 
Elena Diane Curris in the process of that. May her memory and spirit fill us all. Finally, the Curtis family wants to extend our greatest appreciation for our Ambassador Cameron Munter as tonight's speaker. Thank you, sir, for your participation and support to the memory of Elena and the enrichment of CSULB. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, and go beach. <laughs> So I now have the honor of uh, introducing Ambassador Munter. Uh, Ambassador Munter is President and CEO of the East West Institute for Conflict Prevention, which is a nonprofit that anticipates global crises and by building trust and convening partners, seeks to present, prevent conflict. Ambassador Munter served as a U.S. Foreign Service officer for nearly 30 years. He served twice in Iraq, first when he opened the first provincial reconstruction team in Mosul, and later as deputy chief of mission in Baghdad. He was ambassador to Pakistan during a particularly tumultuous time, uh, and uh, ambassador to Serbia at a time of Kosovo's independence. Among, among his domestic assignments was director of Central Europe at the National Security Council under Presidents Clinton and Bush. His overseas postings included Warsaw, Prague, and Bonn during the Cold War, and directly afterward. He was a Rusk Fellow at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University and his numerous other domestic assignments. After his retirement from the diplomatic service, he taught at Columbia Law School and then at Pomona College before taking his current position. Ambassador Munter received his doctorate in modern European history from Johns Hopkins University. He has received honorary doctorates from Pomona College and from Nebraska Wellesleyan University. And he's currently a non-resident fellow at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University and is member member of the Council on uh, Foreign Relations and the American Academy of Diplomacy. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Munter. Thank you. Well, well, thank you all so much. Thanks to the Curtis family for making this possible. Thanks to all of you here at Cal State Long Beach. Yeah, I'll learn. I'll learn how to, how to say that. What I'd like to do is talk with you, not talk to you, uh, and have a chance to have a, a bit of a dialogue. Yeah, you'll hear me rattle on for a little while, but I'd like to be able to take some questions from you as well. Having, having faced some of the nastiest press corps in the world, nothing you can say can make me angry or embarrass me, so we can really talk about just whatever you want. But let me start by doing two things. I'd like to talk a little bit about my diplomatic career to give you some background. Uh, and uh, tell you some stories that those of you who may have heard me a number of years ago when I came here, you may roll your eyes and say, yeah, I heard that one. Okay, but they're still good stories. Um, and then uh, secondly, from that, from those lessons that I think I learned from a diplomatic career, to talk about how diplomacy in the 21st century is different, why the participants in diplomacy are different, and why the problems in diplomacy are different. And in that sense, that's the title, you know, why diplomacy is too important to be left to the diplomats. That's a, that's a riff on what the French president Clemenceau said during the First World War, war is too important to be left to the generals. The same is true, and I can say this as a recovering diplomat, which is I call myself, we are the ones who traditionally under the so-called Westphalian system, the system set up in the 17th century at the end of the Thirty Years' War, that basically codified the way that diplomacy worked, state to state, that that's no longer the way things work. It hasn't gone away. You still have you know, embassies. You still have people working uh, for the state of Jordan, for the state of Indonesia. But that's necessary, but not sufficient. That's the point I'll be making. So let me tell you then about what happens to a kid who grew up about 30 miles from here. I grew up in Claremont. Uh, and I was uh, exiled from California. I, uh, I guess, you know, I was too far from the beach, something like that. I ended up going to East to school, and I studied history. I was going to be an academic, got a doctorate in history. And I learned, uh, as my uh, brother told me, there's no future in the past. 
right? Well, I still believe there's a future in the past. I think that my, my historical training trained me quite well for the kind of uh, cultural, you call it sensitivity, or at least the curiosity that you need to be a diplomat, to learn about foreign countries. And to put yourself in the position, not only uh, 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 geographical, putting yourself in someone's mind, but uh, in terms of time, chronologically, being able to understand where people have come from as well, that other dimension. I think that's something that his history uh, has trained me for. So once again, I did what unemployable, overeducated people do. I joined the Foreign Service. It's an, un, it's an employment system for people who can't get jobs anywhere else. So I joined, and this was during the Cold War. Now, usually what happens uh, in, when you join the Foreign Service, if you speak Chinese, they send you to Uruguay. That's, that's the U.S. government, after all, right? So I came in speaking Polish and Czech and German, and I thought, you know, I'm off to Fiji. And as it turned out, I spent, because I joined right at a time uh, at the end of the Cold War, where these languages are in demand, uh, between 1985 and, 19, and uh, the turn of the century, uh, I never served more than about an hour's plane flight from Berlin. Warsaw, Prague, places like that. And um, I'd like to tell you that I single-handedly uh, brought down the Berlin Wall, but that would be exaggerating. Now, the way, a foreign service, the way a foreign service career works is you have 10 years in which to learn to be obedient. And if you're not obedient in those first 10 years, they throw you out. Then you have another 10 years to learn how to be disobedient and not get caught. And if you're still being obedient, you're not effective. And it's kind of funny, but it's kind of not. Think about this. If you're still playing by the rules, and I'll give you an illustration in a minute, if you're still playing by the rules, you're not being an effective diplomat, right? But you've got to know what those rules are. That's what the first 10 years, the second 10 years. Are. Now, a normal diplomatic career is 20 years. Like the military, it's an up and out system. So just as in the military, most officers leave after 20 years and they read colonel rank. And in the, in the diplomatic service, it's very draconian. 80% are thrown out after 20 years. 20% make it over the threshold, as we say, to the senior foreign service, where they are then eligible to be, bachel uh, to be bachelors, to be uh, ambassadors. That was also to be a bachelor. Um, um, and uh, what happens in that point is you've learned obedience, you've learned disobedience, then you have to learn leadership. And the way that we learn leadership is very unfair and very unsystematic. You learn it by emulation. You learn it by watching people you admire, people who I knew like Ambassador Tom Pickering or Ambassador Frank Wisner or a man uh, who uh, there's a book coming out about uh, next, uh, next week, a man named Richard Holbrook. Uh, this book, this is, I would be remiss as a recovering academic if I didn't give you an assignment. You should read this book. It's called Our Man, Our Man, like Our Man in Havana. Uh, and it's a book that's a biography of Richard Holbrook and the writer George Packer, a fairly well-known writer for The New Yorker, uh, who has written a book called The Unraveling, which is a very, very good book about American uh, kind of politics describes what he calls the end of the American century. It's a very bleak book. And that's another thing I'll foreshadow. I'm not going to be bleak. I'm not as bleak as George Packer. Um, but you emulate these people. You learn from their example. And that's what I like to think got me into the senior foreign service quota so I could go to such garden spots as Iraq and Serbia and Pakistan. In, that, in any case, so here I am back learning obedience. And the first thing I learned was that we're dealing in Eastern Europe with human rights. I was the desk officer for the country formerly known as Czechoslovakia. Throughout my career, I had a problem. I went to countries and they lost pieces of themselves. I was in Czechoslovakia, we lost Slovakia. I was in Serbia, we lost Kosovo. When I arrived in Baghdad, the president of Iraq asked me if my plan was to make Kurdistan independent. So this is just a pattern. I was just thinking, you know, maybe California can also break it. <laughs> it. It's always possible. In any case, what happened is, as an example of this obedience, disobedience, in 1989, James Baker was the Secretary of State, and our ambassador to Czechoslovakia was none other than Shirley Temple. 
Shirley Temple Black. We have an unusual system of choosing ambassadors in the United States, and Shirley Temple Black was our ambassador. And she believed, having arrived in Czechoslovakia in 1989, that she could take the communist government and she could basically knock some sense into them. And a couple of members of the Politburo, who had been in power since 1968, you all recall what happened in Czechoslovakia in 1968. These were pretty, pretty serious Stalinists. She thought, well, if we just, if we just bring them over to the United States, if we just engage with these people, they'll slap themselves in the forehead and say, God, this communism is really stupid. I want to be a capitalist. Uh, I gently tried to tell, with all of my diplomatic charm, I tried to tell Shirley Temple, this is a bad idea. But she was Shirley Temple, and uh, she did what she wanted to do. So she basically talked uh, Jim Baker into having the first meeting of foreign ministers that we had had with the Czechs since 1968. And I was fuming. I, think they, I thought they didn't deserve it. Now, it turns out that there was a guy in uh, Czechoslovakia named uh, Zdeněk Orbanek who had translated Shakespeare into Czech and was a signatory of Charter 77, a human rights document. And he had been offered a job teaching for a semester at the University of Chicago, but because he was a dissident and a human, human rights uh, supporter, uh, the Czechoslovak government had not given him an exit visa, not given him permission to go. So as I was driving up in a cab up Connecticut Avenue, those are the days before texts, I was driving up Connecticut Avenue on my way to the Czechoslovak Embassy. I hatched a plan, which is that I went to my Czech friends and said, I'll make you a deal. And they said, what's that? They said, I said, if you give Zdeněk Orbanek permission to go to the University of Chicago, I'll get you a meeting between James Baker and your foreign minister. And they said, deal. I did this without authorization. Had I asked for authorization, it most certainly would not have come. But you know what? It's one of the things I'm most proud of. And it's Daniel Grabonik taught at University of Chicago. So those kinds of things, that kind of using that kind of leverage for the right reasons is something that you do as a, as a diplomat. Now, I like to think that's how I got, how I made it to the higher levels, but then I found out what really the secret was, which was in 1993, I was then in Prague as the political officer responsible for the uh, reporting back to Washington about the events there. I had a, an ambassador, Shirley had left. I had another ambassador who was utterly humorless. And he asked me to write a cable back, a report back on January 1st of 1993, why Czechs and Slovaks had split, why the country had broken in half. So I wrote what I thought was a pretty good cable. Took it to my ambassador. It says, there are three zones in Central Europe. There's a beer zone, a wine zone, and a vodka zone. And my ambassador, who was humorless, looked at me, said yes, and said, the Poles are in the vodka zone, the Slovaks and the Hungarians are in the wine zone, the Czechs are in the beer zone. You can't have one country in two zones, so they had to split apart. He said, don't, don't send this to Washington. I said, Leave, keep reading, keep reading. The people take on the characteristics of the drinks. The poles are fiery and self-destructive like vodka, right? Any poles here? You know I'm right, yeah? The Hungarians and the Slovaks are smooth and duplicitous like wine. And the Czechs are boring and filling like beer. <laughs> Sorry, I uh, had to say that. Anyway, so he, he said, really, don't, don't send this in. I said, look, it's the key to their foreign policy. You hate the country who drinks what you drink. Who do the Poles hate? The Russians, they drink vodka. Who do the Slovaks hate? The Hungarians, they both drink wine. Czechs, Germans, both drink beer. This is it, the key. I figured it out. He threw me out of his office. So I did what you do in the second 10 years of your career. I thought of a pen name, Ignatius Gripweed, and Ignatius Gripweed went to an underground newspaper in Prague called Prognosis. <laughs> and somehow there was an article on the three zones of Central Europe that appeared in Prognosis the next week. My ambassador called me in that next week, showed me a copy of Prognosis. He said, you know this Ignatius Gripweed? And I said, yeah. And he said, he stole your idea. <laughs> so. 
you see? And I lived to tell the tale. Now, fast forward, these were the days, the heady days when we were erasing the scars that were across Europe. I worked on NATO enlargement, I worked with uh, Madeleine Albright, uh, and uh, the, there was a kind of a Czech cabal at the State Department, Madeleine Albright and me, we were the two Czech speakers. It was one of those ways your career moves ahead. Anyway, and then I ended up in the White House on 9-11. And what happened to American diplomacy on 9-11 is we went from, or at least my work in diplomacy, went from doing nation building, doing human rights, doing these kinds of issues, to doing counterterrorism. And it's not what I'd signed up for, but when you decide to work for the US government and you're in an organization like the State Department, you salute, and that's, and, and that's what you do. Uh, I was unhappy with that because I felt, and I will try to demonstrate through a couple of things I tell you now, how the policy of the United States got a little bit unbalanced. It became more heavily weighted towards counterterrorism, and because it was that, some of the things that we needed to do didn't work out. I was sent uh, in, uh, well, in, in 2006, I was uh, back in Prague as the deputy chief of mission, and I was counseling young uh, foreign service officers that they needed to go to Iraq because they were looking for volunteers. And then I realized nobody in the senior foreign service like myself was volunteering, so I volunteered um, in 2006 to open the first provincial reconstruction team in Iraq. Now, a pr provincial reconstruction team means that you go to a province and you become essentially the governor. You have a lot of money and you have a team. I had a team of about 50 people, about 25 military and about 25 contractors. And we were basically doing what one of them called implementing the Marshall Plan in 1943. That is to say, you're building a country in the middle of a war. And so we would go out and we would build a bridge and the build would, bridge would get blown up. Uh, we would go and talk about microfinance with the village leader and the village leader would disappear. So it was pretty, pretty difficult. The province I got was the province of Nineveh. That's where the town of Mosul is. So I lived in Mosul, uh, which is a tough neighborhood. Um, and what I learned there, which was interesting, was a little bit about the United States. I used the joke, forgive me whoever I told the joke outside to, but the definition of a diplomat, as you know, is uh, someone who will do anything for his country except live there, right? Uh, and of course, I had been out of the country for a long time. I had missed what was going on and the polarization that was taking place in the United States. So here I was on a base outside of Mosul, a lot of barbed wire around, and a couple of people crawled over the wall and killed two members of my team. So I pulled the team together and I said, you guys have to show uh, better security. You have to work better on your safety. And they said, it's okay, boss. We got our weapons in our hooch. Hooch is army speak for the trailers they lived in. We have our weapons in our hooch. What weapon do you have in your hooch? I said, I don't have a weapon in my hooch. Uh, and they said, no, no, we know they didn't issue you a weapon, but you, you brought your weapon from home, right? And I said, I don't have a weapon at home. And 50 people stared at me. And one voice came out from the back and said, are you a Democrat? <laughs> Dead silence. I said, I have two things I want to tell you. I'm a Democrat, and I'm your commanding officer, right? But one fellow came up to me afterwards, and it was actually quite touching. He was a guy from Tennessee. Uh, and he said, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Guys like you don't go to war, right? And it dawned on me that we have a real problem which is there are people who fight America's wars and there are people who don't and there's a gulf between them and that sadly it becomes interpreted as in this particular case kind of a red blue kind of issue that woke me up a little bit well I worked there and my uh, reward for working in there was to come back and be assigned to be ambassador to Serbia now, Serbia was having difficulties with the province of Kosovo, and the province of Kosovo decided in 2008 to declare independence. And when the province of Kosovo declared independence, a number of people got together on the street. I don't know if those of you who watch CNN remember this, but they came and they lit my embassy on fire. Okay, so I was there and CNN is watching the flames come up in my embassy. And what happens is, for those of you who've seen the movie Argo, you know, you're in the embassy and your embassy is burning down. The difference between us and the people in Argo is we could watch CNN and watch from the outside what was actually happening to us. We evacuated the embassy and instead of shredding the paper the way they do in the movie, 
we used a very high-tech way of dealing with our stuff. We literally had sledgehammers, and I went through with a couple of the intelligence officers, and we smashed millions of dollars worth of equipment communications equipment. Those Marines that they have in embassies overseas are not there to protect you or me. They're there to protect the machines that have this, the, all the ciphers and the, the secret information. There is something really fun about smashing hard drives with sledgehammers. I have to tell you, it was really fun. Now, my Marines then came into me and they said, here's a piece of paper, sign this. I said, what's this? It's an authorization to use lethal force. And I said, well, why do I need to sign this? They said, well, sir, you're the ambassador, and if anything goes wrong, this is your decision to kill someone. Oh, okay. So I wondered, why do we have ambassadors? Someone has to take the fall if someone gets killed. So I signed the piece of paper, off the Marines went, and we had the Marines on the perimeter. It was a very tall building. And as we were smashing the equipment, the rioters climbed through the flames, two were killed, burned to death. Um, and uh, they got, a couple of them got to the top, and we had a Marine who was at least nine foot 12, just a gigantic Marine. And he was at the top, and he was authorized to pull out his gun and shoot them. And as a good diplomat, what he did is he said in a deep, deep voice, I suggest you climb back down. And the Serbian protesters who were fairly inebriated took one look at him and climbed back down. And that was, a good, that, was, that was good diplomacy. It's very bad form to shoot people in a country where you're a guest. That's bad diplomacy, right? So we lived through that one. And one of the benefits of that was that they don't give you new equipment for your communications until you can prove that, you know, the coast is clear. I spent the next three months without communications equipment, best three months of my career. I could get no orders from Washington, and I could give no reports to Washington. And there was an election after three months, and the good guys won. And I'm not gonna tell you, nor have I ever told anyone else, what we spent the three months doing to prepare for that victory. But the good guys, the guy who burned the embassy down did not win the election, let's just put it that way. Skip ahead a couple of years, I go to Baghdad. That's my reward for being in, in uh, Serbia. And forgive me for my language, but this was my father who said that. He said, who did you piss off? You know, who did, who did you make angry enough that you have to go after Serbia, you go back to Baghdad? Well, I went back to Baghdad and I led, among other things, a team that was looking for someone we knew was stealing information. And that person was a guy named Bradley Manning. And we caught him and I led the team that caught him. Um, and he, now she, Chelsea Manning, gave all of these, this information to WikiLeaks. And WikiLeaks showed up on the front page of the New York Times. And you can read cables about everything that was happening in US diplomacy. But there's something you can't read, which is the three months after the embassy in Serbia was burned, because there are no cables. There is no record in WikiLeaks of what I did in Serbia. That's one. I had sent back to, 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 to Baghdad, so I was back in, in familiar old Iraq, and I had to there to work, there's a lot of different people who don't speak the same language, a lot of ancient uh, grudges, people who really don't like each other, people who really uh, wanna kill each other, and I'm talking about the State Department and the Defense Department, right? And my job was to be the liaison between the military and the civilians. During my time there, we did the first civilian-military joint plan. We had all that time since 2003 done separate plans. We did a joint plan. And so um, uh, the people there said, this is great. Let's reward this guy. Let's send him to Pakistan. <laughs> and that's where I went next. So I arrived in Pakistan in 2010. Now, in 2010, I've mentioned to you Richard Holbrook. Richard Holbrook was one of these strange people who uh, is larger than life personality. I would describe him as often in error, seldom in doubt, right? He was one of these people who was just very, very sure of himself, committed to a kind of a muscular internationalism that I admire, actually. I'm still an internationalist, even in an age when it's not perhaps fashionable in Washington. And Holbrook had the idea that we in Pakistan had always had misunderstandings with the Pakistanis. We'd had an unbalanced relationship with them. We gave them, I had an aid budget of $2 billion, that's with a B, every year. That was a military assistance budget. 
along with a $1.5 billion civilian assistance budget. That is more than I make in a week in New York. I want you to know that. It's a fair amount of money. So we, we were giving them a lot of money, but it was not as balanced between civilian and military as, as I believed it should be. Holbrook believed the same, that what we were going to do, in addition to working with our Pakistani friends to try to fight the jihadis, we were also gonna to try to build schools. We were gonna to try to build public health institutions. We we're gonna to try to build jobs and long-term prospects, work on rule of law, governance, things of that sort. Um, Holbrook set this up, and we were working very hard to build trust with the Pakistanis in order to say, yes, we want to see you be successful. Because there was skepticism on the Pakistani side. The Pakistanis thought, well, the Americans are only here to give us money because they don't like the terrorists. They don't really care about us. So we were trying to build this trust. And then Holbrook played a terrible trick on me. He died. And uh, the, he was kind of like the sun, and we were all the planets. And then all of a sudden, the sun goes out, and we're a bunch of rocks spinning around in space. And uh, then the year 2011 came. And we had a series of calamities that took place. And they're interesting calamities. I'll, I'll mention them to you. The first was that there was a CIA agent named, uh, uh, what was that guy's name? Raymond Davis, I guess was his name, uh, who shot two uh, Pakistani thugs on the street of Lahore. He had been looking for um, members of uh, a terrorist group that is thought to be uh, responsible for the 2008 Mumbai attacks uh, called Lashka e Taiba, L E T. And we, the Americans, believed that the Pakistani government uh, was uh, somewhat in bed with L E T. That is not necessarily sponsoring them, but certainly not cracking down on them. So we didn't tell the Pakistanis what Raymond Davis was doing, that he was looking for these people. After Raymond Davis shot these people on the street, he went into jail and we had to get him out. Now, Pakistan is a very barbarous, barbarous country. There's countries that still have the death penalty. You know that? And Pakistan's one of them. So in this bar, also a lot of people have guns. I mean, it's a really dangerous country. People have guns, they have the death penalty. Can you imagine living in a place like that? So it was tough. So. There we were, and we had to get this guy out of jail, and he was on the way to being sentenced to death. Now, the way it works in diplomacy is that under the Vienna Convention and all this, if you are admitted to a country as a diplomat, you're not subject to that country's laws. The main, if you are accused of committing a crime, the only thing they can do is throw you out. I remember going after Raymond Davis was, was arrested. I remember going to the Pakistani authorities and saying, Raymond Davis, look, he's got a diplomatic passport. He's got a diplomatic visa. They say, he didn't look like a diplomat. Diplomats don't wear cargo pants and have tattoos. And I said, it doesn't matter what he looks like. You know, he's got, they said, no, we're not letting him out. Interestingly, and this shows you kind of the anthropology of being a diplomat. There is an unusual legal system in Pakistan, and that's called Sharia law which is parallel to the secular law system. So that under the secular law system, Raymond Davis was being marched very quickly towards a death penalty and enthusiastically because he was seen as an arrogant American who had shot two people on the street. He, of course, had done it because he was out thinking that he was being attacked by lashkar e taiba He was actually just, these kids were street thugs that tried to pull a gun on a guy who unfortunately had a gun himself. Now, in Sharia law in Pakistan, there is something called diat, and diat is roughly translated as blood money, where you can pay off the survivors of a, uh, of a uh, victim of a crime, and they basically, if you pay them enough, they have to forgive you. And when they, this judgment under a Sharia court has to be recognized by a secular court. So here, the jihadis in this country we're screaming for Raymond Davis's blood, and we used Sharia law to get him freed and bought him out. And do you think the jihadis liked that? Not one bit. Now, I had a very interesting experience there. That means this was taking place in Lahore. I had an airplane. The ambassador has an airplane, but it's a prop plane. So I'm at the Lahore airport, and the plane, the propellers are turning. And, you know, we're listening, I'm texting people in the courtroom and, you know, Raymond Davis is being freed and he comes out and I'm thinking it's just like Casablanca, right? Except Raymond Davis is not Ingrid Bergman, right? But it's the same idea, you know, we're out there catching that last plane out 
and um, Raymond Davis comes screeching in a car up to the airplane. We put him in the airplane. We fly to Afghanistan. As soon as we're free, there is a drone attack. And I'm not going to talk a lot about drone attacks. A drone attack kills 30 people. We think probably by accident, although I'm not sure. Um, and uh, the people who had helped us, that is the Pakistani secret police who had helped us get Raymond Davis freed, called me in, scrubbed my head figuratively, and said, we help you get Raymond Davis out of jail, and what do you do? You kick us in the teeth with a drone strike. So here we are, trying to build trust with the Pakistani government. I've got the secret police mad at me. I've got every jihadi mad at me. And as I've told the guy who remembered when last time I was here, I told this story. I had a military attache who came to me the next day and said, but boss, what else could go wrong? Right? And what else went wrong was, of course, that six weeks later we had the Osama bin Laden raid. Now, for those of you who've seen the movie Zero Dark Thirty, it's surprisingly accurate. Uh, which also convinces me that many of my friends in the CIA who thought I thought didn't talk to Hollywood, talk to Hollywood. So it's very accurate. And what my job was, was to make sure that Americans would be safe in the event of this, for the Americans who were in Pakistan. I was aware from 2010 when I went out to Pakistan that we were watching that house. But the accounts you've read that the president didn't know for sure that that was Osama bin Laden, those are true. He didn't know, even to the time of the raid. And all those debates that they had is, is he there? Should they go? What's, you know, 100%, 50%? Those are all true. Those accounts are true. So I basically uh, was hosting a dinner that night. We all had to act as if everything was normal. I had 12 rectors of Islamic universities around my table. So 12 guys with beards and me. And I did what you don't do is, excuse me, please. I left my... My, my dinner party, I went into the embassy and I just didn't go back. So I'm not sure that I did a whole lot for, um, you know, exchanges. I'm not sure that they really appreciated that. I went into the embassy and basically what I got to do was watch the Osama bin Laden raid on the screen. Now in our embassy, and I'm telling you things you know, although technically you shouldn't know, is that there is a thing called a station. And a station is where the intelligence officers, where the CIA people are. In the station there are four screens. The top screen was a drone from 5,000 feet taking the picture of what was happening in Abbottabad. And that is very faithfully shown in the movie. Um, you just from you're looking up and you see the compound. One picture next to it is a picture of Obama, Hillary, Joe Biden, famous you know, Hillary's chewing on her finger. You've seen this picture. They're all watching the raid. That's the next screen. The third screen is Admiral McRaven. In Afghanistan, he was the head of the Navy SEALs who were doing the operation. And the fourth screen is myself and my intelligence and my military advisors. So there's four screens. And we're watching the screen. We've been briefed. There's going to be two helicopters coming swooping in. One is going to land and secure the perimeter, just like in the movie. And one is going to drop people down ropes on top of the house and get bin Laden. First helicopter comes in, lands, secures the perimeter just the way it was supposed to be, with the dog, just as you have you heard. Second helicopter crashes. And so all of us who remembered 1980, that is to say the famous Desert One uh, crash when they tried to free the hostages in Iran, we all getting sweat under our armpits and saying, oh God, you know, are we going to do this again? What's wrong with... Um, and uh, Admiral McRaven, who's this incredible specimen of a human, his pulse is like 40, right? His pulse spikes to something like 41. You know, you know, we're all going, oh my God, oh my God. He goes, Plan B, or so, you know, or he spoke some militaries for Plan B. Instead of going down ropes into the house, they blast their way through a wall, go up the stairs, and they get Bin Laden. One thing they did at that time in addition to killing bin Laden, was that they took all of the intelligence, they took all of the uh, uh, computers and thumb drives and everything else out of the, out of the Abbottabad um, uh, house. That, I'll get back to that in a minute, they take that, they take the body, they put it in the, in the helicopter, and then they have to blow up the other helicopter because it had been damaged. They had to destroy it because it was very high-tech kind of helicopter. Otherwise, they might have slipped in and slipped out without anyone knowing. But they do blow the helicopter. And uh, so I say then to my boss, Hillary Clinton, on the screen, you know who's going to get the first phone call? 
It's my job. She I said, what should I tell the Pakistanis? She says, don't tell them anything. And that was helpful, right? <laughs> so I thought about that. A couple hours later, I get a call from the foreign secretary. He's the very professional diplomat who number two in their system. He says, Cameron, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm sorry to call you, but there was a helicopter crash up in Abbottabad. Do you know anything about that? And I was ready for him. I said, I'll get back to you, Salman. Thought I'd outwitted him here. And he thought about it for a minute, and he says, Cameron, you don't sound like you were asleep. No, no, I wasn't. So once the, once the helicopters got back into Afghan airspace with Osama bin Laden's body, um, our chairman of our joint chiefs called the general who basically runs Pakistan and briefed him on all of this. But we weren't sure what would happen at that point because in 1979, there had been an attack on the great mosque in Mecca by some radicals. And true to conspiracy theories in that part of the world, it was blamed on who? The Americans. And in 1979, this was not many people know this because we were focused on the hostage crisis in Iran. But our embassy in Islamabad, the capital of Pakistan, was burned to the ground, and three people were killed. So we expected that to happen again after the bin Laden raid. When you're assigned to a country like Pakistan, you have a, a bag by the door all the time. You're ready for that phone call. You have a phone tree. So I had to call everyone in. I was not allowed to talk to anybody about the raid. I was the only non-intelligence officer who knew about it. So I had to wake up a bunch of people at 3 in the morning, call them in, and then get everyone else in so they'd be protected in case we were uh, attacked. We had four installations in Pakistan. In Karachi, we were by the water. And as you may know, they took the body of Osama bin Laden to a ship called the Carl Vinson. And that ship is where they basically prepared the body and then buried it at sea. That Carl Vinson was also going to send helicopters to evacuate our people in Karachi at our consulate. Our, Karachi, our consulate in Lahore, 40 miles from India, they could make a convoy and make a run for it. But in Peshawar, and especially in the embassy in Islamabad, there was nowhere to go. So we decided we would hunker down. We got everyone in from outside, and the Marines came to me, and they brought me a piece of paper. I said, what's that? They said, this is a piece of paper called authorization to use lethal force. I said, oh, we'd like you to sign this. So I signed it. And you see standing in front of you the only ambassador who has ever signed that piece of paper twice. Fortunately, in both cases, they never had to use lethal force. This is part of what convinces me that the Pakistanis did not, one of the reasons I'm convinced, the Pakistani government did not know that Osama bin Laden was there. Most people believe, of course, they knew. Here's this guy living in a house a mile from their equivalent of West Point. How could they not know? Or, as Newt Gingrich said on TV, how stupid do you think we are? You know, logically, that's true. But in all of that equipment, all of that uh, intelligence that they took out of that building, that they took out of the house in Abbottabad, I had, and with a number of other people, we had to read it all. There's no indication they knew. So it's another lesson about the way the world works in that part, in that part of the world. If you have a choice between conspiracy and incompetence, Mostly, it's incompetence. That is, and people are always looking for conspiracy. But in this particular case, I just think the Pakistanis didn't know. It was terribly humiliating for them. And when I went and saw the general the next morning to try to talk about what we did next, his first words were, congratulations, you got him. And we tried desperately for a few hours to spin this so it wouldn't be humiliating for the Pakistanis. But the Pakistanis eventually got humiliated. And we had a number of people who were working in the tribal areas, trying to work with the Pakistanis, special operations troops. And as a result, this general said, they've got to go. They've got to leave. And I said, you know, the way it works with us, uh, our Congress has a rule that the Congress calls no boys, no toys. If, the, if you send these people away, we have to take all the equipment, all the night vision goggles, all the sniper rifles, all the computers. We have to take it all away. And he said, I don't care. Get them out of here. So I went back to Peshawar, where I watched C-17s, big cargo planes, taking all this equipment that we had given to the Pakistanis that we were going to use together to try to fight the radicals. 
So you can see this plan. Remember the plan I was talking about with Richard Holbrook? We were going to kind of make friends with these guys. We're going to build trust. We're going to nosedive. Next day, had a meeting. Mike Nagata, my military attache, comes in and says, what else could possibly go wrong? Well, what else could possibly go wrong? A couple months later, a group of about a dozen American and Afghan special forces came accidentally across the border into Pakistan, and they were fired upon by Pakistani border guards. And when that happened, um, they fired back. And America is famous for kind of uh, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. So they came in and they called, brought in what is a, a, a gunship, which is called a warthog. It's a slow-flying plane that shoots a lot of uh, very deadly uh, projectiles. And they just obliterated about uh, a border base with about 30 uh, Pakistani soldiers. Um, and I got on the phone to uh, the White House and I said, um, I think we need to apologize. We made a mistake. They say, well, they fired first. I said, we were 10 miles in Pakistan. What would, what would any country do if you were 10 miles in their country? And uh, the person who shall remain nameless, who was in the White House at that time, this is 2011, remember, said, well, haven't you read Romney's book? I said, Romney wrote a book, right? He said, Romney, you know, this is, Romney's going to be the candidate of the Republicans in 2012. Romney wrote a book called No Apologies, right? I said, look, person who I shall not name, um, there's a time for statecraft and there's a time for, uh, there's a time for politics and this is a time for statecraft. Uh, needless to say, I lost this argument. Uh, the Pakistanis shut down as a result of our not apologizing, shut down our supply lines through Pakistan to Afghanistan. So we were forced for the next six months, until we apologized, to bring our supplies for our troops in Afghanistan in through the territory of our new best friend, Vladimir Putin, the so-called Northern Distribution Network, at a cost of about $500 million, which is also more than I make in a week. And um, uh, uh, it just showed we had pretty much hit bottom with the Pakistanis. So I give you those story that those tales of woe, A, to illustrate what can happen to an innocent guy who speaks Polish and Czech and wants to you know, drink vodka with his friends, um, but how you have to adjust, and especially how I felt that our relationship, our efforts to try to build a healthy relationship with Pakistan was the victim of circumstances that really put the questions of our uh, security and our long-term interests at, at, at odds. Um, having had so much fun, I retired from the Foreign Service in 2012. And uh, as I think uh, was mentioned, I, I taught for a couple of years um, and then came to the East-West Institute where I am now. Now, with all those stories that I've told you, and I've used up all kinds of time, I want to just go to the second part of what I want to talk about, and I'll be much briefer. This inc these incidents and these things show the serendipity, I think, of a political career but also that you can go through these kinds of different uh, experiences and come out, as I am, more, more optimistic about our chances than I was when I went in. And why would that be? Because I've told you about the tales of daring do and about signing pieces of paper and about these other issues. But along the way, what you end up seeing is that there are many other things that are going on which are extraordinarily positive that have to do with the rubric that many of you heard of, which is called American soft power. And this second part that I'm just briefly going to talk to you about is that I think the diplomacy in the 21st century is increasingly dealing with problems which are bigger, not that these problems I'm talking about from my career, these security issues, these terrorist issues, et cetera, aren't enormously important. But there are so many other issues that are, in, that are important that can't be dealt with by an embassy, by an ambassador, by a diplomat. These are the issues like global warming. These are issues like uh, rights of women around the world. These are issues like the uh, future of safe energy. Uh, issues like proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. You can't just have states working on this. You have to have, basically, you can either call them public-private partnerships, or you can call them anything you like. But some illustrations of this. When I was in Pakistan, I remember going to the Agricultural University of Pakistan in Faisalabad, and they trotted out their oldest uh, professor who had studied in the United States. 
and he came to me. He was this very old guy, and he says, Mr. Ambassador, have you ever heard of, and I'm, I'm just waiting, have I heard of what? Have you ever heard of UC Riverside? <laughs> so, well, yeah, I, I, I grew up near UC. I've been to UC Riverside. And he said, you know, I've been to this agricultural university for years. Those guys at UCR, they're so good at lemons. They're so good at lemons, right? And I realized what this was about was the kind of links that America has through, say, a university that counted much more than any kind of Raymond Davis on the streets of Lahore, counted much more than any kind of Osama bin Laden. Those kinds of soft power ties we have. Another example, I had this enormous budget I told you about, and one of the things we worked on was to try to eliminate polio from Pakistan. Polio exists in three countries in the world, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and uh, Nigeria, and our goal was to eliminate polio uh, 10 years ago in Pakistan. Now, as many of you who've seen the movies about Osama bin Laden know, we, not we, the CIA, without telling the ambassador, decided to enlist a health worker to try to take blood samples from Abbottabad to prove that that was Osama bin Laden. That is true. The doctor got caught. He is currently in jail for the next 30 years in Pakistan. But in addition to the poor guy being in jail, um, uh, this meant that people in Pakistan thought that health workers worked for the CIA. And so our health workers who were administering polio vac uh, inoculations, vaccines, uh, were attacked and some of them were actually killed in the tribal areas of Pakistan, the remote areas of Pakistan. So we pulled them out and we admitted defeat. We didn't eliminate polio. When I retired, from the Foreign Service, I became a consultant for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, and uh, worked with them in different ways. And there's a lot of details, but suffice it to say, we went about it differently. And it's not that Bill Gates is smarter than the US government, although he's pretty smart, um, but you, we use different people. We just use different approaches. And to make a long story short, it is likely that polio will be eliminated from Afghanistan and Pakistan by 2020. The moral of the story there is, it's the wise ambassador who doesn't say, what are you doing on my turf, Bill Gates? But it's the wise ambassador who says, we couldn't do it. Thank God they could. There are the people who are doing what we all want to get done. This partnership is the partnership of an NGO, or I mentioned earlier, the partnership of a university, or you could say the partnership of business in different areas. Those are the areas where not only we, the Americans, have an enormous advantage. We're a very well-developed philanthropic sector, very well-developed NGO sector. But also, the problem it's not only the participants in these problems, but it's the problems themselves. Again, they cross borders. You cannot deal with climate change as one country, and you can't deal with climate change with government. Even with civic government, even different levels of government, you've got to have business involved. You've got to have civic action. You've got to have all kinds of uh, participants. So in the 21st century, a thing I would say to you, you know, if any of you are thinking of a career in international relations, don't limit yourself. I made the, the statement when I, I said, oh, okay, well, what do I do? You know, I'm an I'm, I'm a, I'm a overeducated PhD. What am I going to do with myself? Join the Foreign Service. Well, there's a lot of other things a guy like me could do or a guy like you, people like you who are here at, at uh, Long Beach, you can go into the Peace Corps. You can, and when you're in the Peace Corps, you're going to learn the skills that are going to prepare you, not necessarily to work for another government agency. You might. You might work for the U.S. military. You might work for the U.S. intelligence. You might work for the State Department. But you might work for McKinsey. You might work for Bill Gates. You might work for a bank. In other words, it may seem counterintuitive that these people are involved in, in diplomacy, but increasingly that's what's happened. And because that's what's happening, we're getting away, I think, over time, and this is something that's going to show uh, only manifest itself in the years to come, we're getting away from the preponderance of what's happening uh, that, where we depend only on diplomats to take care of international problems. Some people have commented to me, even this evening, that the current administration is not a big friend of the Foreign Service. And it, you have to really, it's obvious that this is true. Uh, the budget for the State Department that was put forward by the President this year is a cut of 25%. It's a pretty big cut. Most of the people who I worked with uh, in, uh, have left the Foreign Service. 
thrown out or, um, or have, have decided to leave. We have a problem that the Foreign Service has weakened. That doesn't mean that diplomacy is ending. It just means that if, for whatever reason, that's the decision that our government chooses, the issues are going to be done in other ways. Other people are going to take up the slack. And so when you say, where is the future? I would like to see a strong foreign service, but these problems are going to be dealt with one way or another, no matter what happens to the foreign service. So in terms, first of all, of careers of those people, if you're teachers, those careers who you're advising, or for you who are, who are students, there is a broad range of things that is going to, are going to be leading the way that diplomacy works in the future. That makes me optimistic, because I think the partners in other countries, as other countries develop, as you see the boom in Southeast Asia, for example, the change in Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, uh, Vietnam, the, the incredible progress these countries have made. As these countries change, they're also developing different sectors of people who I, at the East-West Institute, doing the conflict mediation. These are our partners, and these are people who didn't have the money and the time to do projects with us on uh, wildlife trafficking or on other ec ecological issues that we now do with people in the Philippines. So that the developments that are taking place that seem to be in many ways so scary, that is the unevenness of globalization. Yes, there's populism. Yes, there's the challenges to the rules-based order and all these kinds of things you read about. But there's also a new class or new classes of persons who are now much more aware of the transnational issues that I've talked about, who are our partners. So it's not just Americans. We have better partners, especially I would point to Southeast Asia, Central Asia. You don't read a lot about Kazakhstan, but there's a very significant middle class in Kazakhstan, as an example, that's working on desertification because they have mismanaged their water resources. Those are the people we're gonna work with in the future. So that's the message I hope you take away, which is, in addition to the good stories about beer, wine, and vodka, and the other kinds of things, that I do come away optimistic that this period that we're going into is the period of bigger problems, but a lot more people taking part. So with that, I've gone a little longer than I wanted to, but I would like to see if I could take at least a question or two, if I haven't totally knocked you dead. Okay, thanks. See, he's storming out in protest. You see that? <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you for a lovely talk. Um, the question I had was that, you know, you arrive at this logic of soft power, um, and you began with your stories about the 1990s in Eastern Europe and Iraq. Um, and to me, in some ways, I feel like that has been the history of soft power, right, in the way you've narrated, mm -hmm. that um, the, what happened in Eastern Europe and in Russia um, was this experiment in privatization. Um, in the Middle East, it was Halliburton and the experimentation and privatization of military power. And in some ways, I'm uncertain whether it is a substitution for states doing nation building or doing other things. I, I don't, I think it's... Two, two very important points you make. A, I, I don't mean to say that soft power uh, always works. So very good point. I mean, you correct me on that. Soft power doesn't always work. The kinds of things that we were doing in, say, Czech Republic or Poland or Hungary or the Baltic states, Many things failed. There, the rule of law is a good example because in almost all of our programs there was a rule of law um, component. And whenever you try to come into a country and say, you know, hey, Latvia, you need not only uh, new standards of evidence for detectives and police, but new judges who will look at those standards of evidence and then new correctional facilities for the people you put in jail, bada bing, bada bing, bada bing. Yes, that's ideal. But those things, that, that, that doesn't always work in a linear fashion. So don't let me, you, you've 
properly corrected me that the impulse to do that is not a guarantee of the success of those programs. But with participation, you don't get the work that I've done in Ukraine, for example, the work in rule of law in Ukraine, you don't get there by just having a government like the Americans or the Germans build a courthouse. But you have NGOs you work with, you have exchanges of uh, judges, you, you, and over time, you know, for all of the things that you read, the scathing things, everything you read about uh, justice, say, in Ukraine, it's a lot less corrupt than it was 20 years ago. It's just not all the way uncorrupt, right? So I, 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 I take your point. It's not all of a sudden we can do things uh, with soft power and therefore they work. It's, it's a hard road, but it's uh, the right direction. Secondly, you are right that it, it doesn't replace the need for governmental work. Government, uh, say the Foreign Service, the diplomats, the military, the intelligence, they have to be partners in this. And so part of the prog program is learning on both sides to work with one another. One of the things we do as basically the East-West Institute, we're marriage counselors for countries. Right, we get the husband, we get the wife, we sit them down, we you know make them talk. We we try to get people at the table, for example, to talk about counter uh, about uh, cyber security, encryption issues. We bring the FBI to sit down with Apple, and we bring Huawei to the same table, and we bring Chinese intelligence to the same table, and Israeli intelligence to the same table, and we say there's lots of things you guys disagree about, so why don't we lock you in a room and give you lots of food to eat? and tell you, come up with the things you can agree about. Does that mean we solve all the problems? Of course not. So I take from your comment, it is wise to be humble about what you can achieve, but I am confident that the way we're doing it is the right way to do it. Another question? Hi, uh, you mentioned the climate change briefly, but I'm curious um, in the future we face possible major issues as far as- That was very diplomatically put. <laughs> potential for global unrest, lots of, um, lots, of, lots of risk. What role can diplomacy play in that future? Yeah, um, it, it's interesting because part of the role that diplomacy plays, when you think of, uh, uh, when you're taking a course, I think when I was teaching courses in IR, it's, it's very important to draw a distinction between foreign policy and diplomacy. In a way, foreign policy is the impulse to change things, and diplomacy is the implementation of those things. And so the diplomacy that I'm talking about is making sure you have the pieces in place who can implement. But the more basic question I hear you asking is, what about the policy? What about getting people to understand that you have to work together on this. And I don't think we've achieved that yet. We don't, at least in this country, have unanimity or at least consensus about it. There's consensus in a lot of other countries. Let's say in Europe, you'll find pretty good consensus about the need to do things, but we don't have it here. So we are crippled in the United States, in my opinion, by the fact that we have many tools to deal with it. For example, the state of California is doing enormous things internationally to uh, when, when uh, Germans come over to the United States, I mean, this is no secret, they don't bother to go, you know, the, the environmental minister just doesn't bother to go to Washington, he goes to Sacramento. You know, because he realizes that standards on fuel emissions for cars and stuff in California have such a business impact that talking to people who don't agree on climate change may not be as fruitful as coming to, say, here, talking to businesses, talking to NGOs. So a big problem on unanimity of purpose. B, I think those mechanisms are going to kick in. That is the, 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 the soft power things I was talking about. They are gonna, they are gonna kick in, uh, I think, about, um, about climate change. And one place, there's a, a gentleman named James Fallows who uh, is, writes uh, a lot of magazines, articles, and he has talked about a kind of an optimistic picture he has for different civic governments in the United States that he's visited and how different cities increasingly are taking on 
elements of climate change. So we think of climate change as a transnational issue. It's also kind of a subnational issue. They're, you know, the, the people who live in Louisiana kind of see things differently than people who live in North Dakota. So I think that this is um, going to be a matter of political organization that is, yes, it's got to happen at the national level for general consensus of international agreements, but a lot of work's going to be done at the subnational level and at the transnational level. And so I, 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 I think the mechanisms are in place to do things. What I hope is that we can come to a consensus. And I, I, I share your concern that we don't have a national consensus yet. But, you know, everyone has to jump. <clears throat> uh, first, thank you for your talk and congratulations to Richard. It's maybe one of the best events in my memory. No, anyway, uh, if you don't mind, my question will be less diplomatic than it should be. I am from the land of vodka, after all. Which, so, which, which land of vodka? Uh, no, Russia. Okay, well, come so, uh, on. Two questions. Uh, he says from, it's uh, self-evident that, of course, Russia is the land of vodka. <laughs> so from a land of vodka perspective, I have two questions, maybe less diplomatic than it should be. But I'm truly interested in your opinion on two arguments. One is uh, when Democrats are in power, international politics becomes less predictable, driven by uh, universalist claims like uh, global change, climate change, and so forth. Uh, they allow things like Islamic State to happen. When Republicans come to power, it's immediately almost over. Uh, uh, second claim that uh, Kosovo was a mistake. It allowed Crimea to happen because the way Kosovo was established uh, led, uh, allowed Russians to claim, you know, Crimea is the same story. So if you could comment on these two, sorry, if not sure. politically uh, or like... No, no, happy to. Thank happy you. to. On that second claim, I think you have a point. I spent a lot of my life arguing that there are legal reasons why Kosovo is different because of the role of the UN, because of Russian uh, efforts, the, the Russian agreement to the way that Kosovo was set up, that it was, that all, all of the Security Council agreed to 1244 and to the arrangements that set up the legal status of Kosovo and the prospect that Kosovo would become independent. And no one did that for Crimea. That said, these legalisms don't always convince people. And I think the Russian public or many people who are, uh, uh, you know, uh, say in the Russian government are saying, look, uh, it's okay for you to let a country break off when you want it to break off, but we can't break another country off when we want to break it off. That logic is definitely something that makes these, it makes it, a, it's difficult. So it makes the West less pure in its argumentation. I happen to believe that the legal differences are significant enough that Russia annexing Crimea, a country taking another country, when the country, uh, you know, uh, taking a piece of the country away is different than an independence movement that has been sanctioned as a possibility by the UN, th that there's a difference there. But you are right that this is gray, this is gray politics and a lot of people don't, don't agree. Uh, the first question was, I thought, a kind of an odd one. I'm not sure I understood it, which is when the, when the Democrats come in, things fall apart, and when the Republicans come in, everything makes sense? Not, not fall apart, but like uh, Islamic State happened when uh, Democrats were in power. As soon as the Republicans came to power, it's over. We immediately yeah. Policies. I, I, okay, on the Islamic State, I, I tend not to see that as, a, maybe because I worked for Democrats and Republicans, I don't tend to see it as a partisan issue. It's much more the question, you know, George Bush signed the papers pulling out American troops. So when you say, if one were to say, the reason that the, uh, the Islamic State came in is because the Democrats pulled, pulled out and then the Islamic State came. George Bush made that decision. Now, whether it's right or wrong, I don't blame him as a Republican or as a Democrat. You know, he was the president and he thought that was the right thing to do or he needed to do that. So maybe we who used to work in the government as civil servants, maybe we're blind, but it was never seen inside the government as a partisan issue. It was never seen as a Democratic or a Republican decision. It was seen that the president decided to pull out troops because most Americans were sick of the war. It turned out to be a, a gamble 
and the, the ISIS came, and then America decided after ISIS came to fight ISIS and then won. Most people that I know in the government would not associate that with Democrat and Republican. But everyone's entitled to his or her opinion. Maybe one more. Thank you. Ambassador, welcome to Long Beach, and thank you for your great talk. Um, you want I to wanna, tell them where you were on May 2nd of uh, 2011? I think, yeah, it was my last visit to Islamabad, and we raised a toast to, to the, to the getting, getting successful us raid yeah, okay. in, the, in the embassy. And okay. uh, I still remember thinking to, my to myself at the time, I was like, it's going to, it's downhill from here. Yeah. And, it, um, and, and, you were, and you were right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Beyond, beyond my imagination. Um, to, to come back to what you were saying though about, about that, the lack of consensus, not just on climate change, but on so many other issues, do you see a role for organizations like East West Institute and others in bringing together, uh, in helping restore some consensus in America, right? Um, I think it was Richard Haas who said, you know, foreign policy begins at home. Yeah. And it seems to me like American foreign policy has lost so much effectiveness and credibility because of the breakdown of our domestic politics. So how can we, how can we restore that? It's a huge issue, and I was just at an event with David Petraeus in New York a few days ago, and someone asked him, what's the biggest threat to the United States? And he said, basically what you said, is our own inability to, to come, you know, it's not cyber warfare, it's not China, it's our own inability to come together. And I don't know if institutions like ours can do that, uh, you know, we are, after all, we think we're pretty cool, but, you know, we're, we're you know, 50 people. We have offices in Moscow and Brussels and, and on an island off the coast of North America called Manhattan, um, you know, and uh, places like that. But I'm not sure that we, we can do that. Uh, I think in the long run, maybe a web of this public and private institutions can pull together on a consensus. But what I'm most concerned about, and I don't have an answer about, I think I mentioned this when we had our lunch today when we were talking, is, is that the, the thing that I found in a democracy building where we had hubris and we needed to learn a little humility was that you can set up the structures of democracy, but you have to have in various ways the content of democracy the, 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 the stuff of democracy, and it's different in every country, and uh, you can't expect it to be always the same, but at some point there have to be what you would call uh, this, this uh, sub-national institutions, and by this I'm talking about the kinds of tissue that bind citizens to their, to their government and that the government does not seem far away. And usually, in traditionally, in the era before social media, you had institutions like a trade union, or you had a uh, church that you were a member of, or you had a club, and there was a famous book called Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam, the sociologist from Harvard, who talks about bowling clubs. But this, is, this idea is not new with Robert Putnam. This is Tocqueville. This goes back to the idea of voluntary associations who make up the, you know, the local newspaper has died in the United States. And local newspapers were not there to tell you what to think about Trump. They were to tell you about the local zoning law and how do you as a citizen trust your fellow citizens who you live with about whether you're gonna give this guy a liquor license. You know, real, real basic stuff. So my concern is that we can talk about the broader big questions in institutions like mine or universities, can talk about the foreign policy questions that, you know, again, we've talked about global warming, we could talk about energy issues, um, but I don't know how one builds the kind of trust that you need to have other than having those kinds of institutions. And I'm not trying to say, you know, what are we going to do, force people to meet their wife at a church social instead of going online? You know, are we going to put that genie back in the bottle? You know, how, how, do, you, how do you change? 
how do you uh, change the, uh, the impact of social media as an example? And I guess the first step would only be to be aware of it and to think about the debate that doesn't have to do so much with um, institutional power or ideology, but has to deal with the kind of things that, you know, like if you read David Brooks in the New York Times, you talk about, you know, what about talking about decency? What about talking about the concept of, you know, when I was in Poland in the 1980s, there was this phrase, which for those of you Polish speakers, nie ma wolności bez solidarności. You cannot have freedom without solidarity. That is, freedom without the responsibility and the feeling for others is license, right? You only get that from a kind of morality that comes from some sort of sense that, you know, there are things bigger than you. And I don't know, I don't know how you get that back. So that's the most troubling question that I can imagine because A, I agree with you, you can't have a strong foreign policy without some domestic consensus. And you can't have some domestic consensus unless those guys I'm with and Mosul, you know, can, can look at me and say, ah, yeah, Democrats do fight the wars with us. We are from the same group. You know, we are on the same side. And, you know, I hear from my Manhattan Democrat friends some pretty awful things about the people who I then go talk to in Washington uh, who are working in the Trump administration. You know, this demonization really does go both ways, and I hope that what we can figure out is uh, how those institutions, maybe we won't create the old institutions, but maybe we'll make new ones in some way. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks again to the Curtis family for this opportunity. Thank you.